So imagine your Imperial Guard, maybe Space Marines, maybe Tau, and you've just obliterated the battlefield. You've saturated the battlefield with heavy weapons teams, bombardment, artillery. No man's land has been completely decimated and destroyed. Nothing. Nothing can survive. And yet, shadows begin moving. Things become, things start marching forward. Hordes of chaos, hordes of cultists pour forward in the name of corn. Berserkers follow up, chosen follow up. You're rolling fistfuls of dice. You're killing scores and scores of chaos and cultists and chaos space marines but they still crash into your ranks. We're literally climbing over fallen bodies to get to you. You can have your faith in the Emperor, which is lacking. You can have your faith in the greater good, your tech, your psychics, your magics, your space elf stuff, your Necron mathematics, whatever it's going to be, doesn't matter. We put you to the chainsword. We put you to the bolt pistol. We take the field. I pile your bodies high to corn, and my champion stands on your broken bodies and corpses and looks down in glory. That's what I see. That is the vision. That is the voice. That is the execution of everything. The reality, following up on some comments here from a previous podcast and from my blog, you build your assault army in 40K, you line things up, you're pumped up, for visions of glory like that and your opponent just rolls a bunch of dice you take your models off and you go home that's kind of where the assault is and the challenge here i find in running an all assault themed army a mono build army there's this idea with a mono build where it's not just unique to 40k could be with BattleTech, could be um with other aspects too with the exception of historical wargaming there's nothing really historical about a mono build, you take one aspect of the game. It could be focusing on a unit. It could be focusing on a um, a power. And you pour all of your squadron points, battle points, regular points, battle value, whatever the currency is going to be to buy units, into that. And you leverage it forward. Um, The key when you do this is to understand going in, it's going to be that overrepresentation is going to be unbalanced. And you're going to come up against certain roadblocks um, in the rules or other armies that um, you need to counter, you need to have an answer for, or even if you can't counter it, you need to kind of have a way around it. And when you do that, it's going to be a brutal uphill battle. But this is coronate glory here, right? This is glory. Immortality is yours to take. Will you be the last man standing? or the last Chaos Marine standing, or, or the cultist standing in there, um, the challenge is going in. If you know them, it makes playing it a little bit easier. But certainly deciding, especially in 40K, to run an assault-themed army. Um, in every edition that I've played 40K, um, I played Rogue Trader, but that was kind of more of a skirmishy type game on there. Um, I really played 3rd edition pretty heavy in the beginning, then stopped for a little while. Played fourth heavy, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and, and on and on, or and hopefully into the future here. The assault has never been widely supported, with the exception of 40k fourth edition. Assault armies were beast. Um, Gene Steelers and Tyranid assault armies were auto win. You just set them up, you come back in 20 minutes, and it's over. Blood Angels and other assault armies were beast. Corn was pretty messed up because you had the um, burning blood where you'd have to test 1d6 every turn for your cornate units. And if you roll a one, um, the butcher's nails kind of went insane. I mean, I, I like the idea, GW, but very poor execution. And basically, you ran and assaulted the closest thing because you guys were so jacked up. And when I was playing cornate berserkers in fourth edition, uh, this led to numerous. You couldn't bring these guys to tournaments. Even with the Demon Bomb, you, you couldn't bring them to tournaments because just crazy stuff happened. Um, they'd run towards the closest unit. So one time I was playing, the closest unit was a drop pod. And you couldn't hurt drop pods in 4th edition, really, just unarmed, unless you had melt of bombs Litanies of Hate let you get rerolls on the melt of bombs And I threw a little loophole on there, which, of course, we abused. So routinely... Um, and, and pods were, were kind of hot back then. 
uh, Space Marine players would just drop a bunch of empty pods. You don't even need this, the Hurricane Bolter and the Whirlwind thing, whatever they have in their pods at the time. All my guys, my entire army, you know, 60 Berserkers ran up and just I, I couldn't do anything. Um, another time, they would bail out of the vehicles. So you'd, you'd put these guys in, in rhinos. Uh, you rush them forward. The rhino would keep going. You'd roll a one. They'd, they'd dump out and bail out. So you ran them on foot. And then, of course, running them on foot, they got torrented down. Um, I bring this up to say you had to have a workaround. You had to have a, a, a challenge. That's what we're going to look at in this podcast. Now, I'm going to build on it a little bit because that foundation is up in my archive here on YouTube, Wargamer Fritz. Um, we've got the Warhammer 40K playlist. I'm going to put a link, one or two links, direct links to my blog. Uh, this is going to illustrate the actual units, all of my units that I play in my Berserkers of Scalothrax, my Chaos Space Marine Cornate Glory Army. And um, it's going to talk a little bit more about this, this wave theory, and we're going to explore it um, on that aspect. So if you're interested in the follow-up, after this podcast, this vlog, uh, that's going to push you out over into that direction. So the first thing, identify the assault. Why does the assault not really work? Why is the assault imbalanced in 40K? No judgment, no hate, just, well, it's always hate if it's corn, just to be aware, what are we up against? Um, and also when I'm building an army and, and I'm looking and seeing how is it going to work, whatever army it's going to be, you have to take an honest assessment of the rules and say, do the rules favor this? You know, how, how do the rules um, work on there? And, and really be honest and be upfront with how, what your plan is to make your army work. The reason why the assault is gimped in 40K is the fact that it's all about the dice. It's a D6 system. Um, you have different variables that then turn it into a D3 or other um, dice, but it's still a D6 system for the majority of the things. And it's about dice pools. I mean, literally a unit is really just wound and dice counters on there. I mean, we could reduce it down to a little token that shows how many dice you get to roll. And as you take losses, those dices become less and less. So essentially, if we have two units, if I can get the jump on you, and this could be, um, you know, if we use Space Marines as, as kind of the benchmark, you know, T4 Bolter, even if I get the jump on you with, um, you know, units that are Strength 3 auto guns, we're going to look at cultists in a second, if I get the jump on you first and I can generate enough dice, if I can generate enough alpha currency, I'm going to win. I'm going to win. Because every turn we get weaker and weaker, both of us, but if I do more alpha and I reduce your dice pool turn by turn, eventually we're going to hit the tipping point. Eventually we're going to hit what I call critical mass. And this is important for all armies, but especially assault armies. Critical mass means you have the dice volume to accomplish your goals, whether that's um, making sure that you have enough models on an objective, whether that means taking out uh, certain elements of your opponent's army, once you drop below critical mass, unless you get mad lucky, and, and that happens, that's why it's confusing. That's why in 40K, you're like, I, I don't understand it. You know, it, it worked, and I, I rolled a couple of dice, and I pulled it off. An example, I remember this was um, uh, playing, I got to post that up on the archives, playing Brother Captain James's um, Ultramarines, and I was playing my Necrons, and it was like a vital objective or some building we had to take. doesn't matter what. He had a group of five Terminators in there. And I've got a group of three warriors left in, in this one group. That's the only thing that can really do it anywhere there. So I'm thinking, okay, I could shoot, but then I'm kind of um, stuck there. And if I, if I fail, uh, James is going to get the objective. But if I charge, I don't know, maybe something will happen. We'll see. It's 40K. You never really know. Um, and if I charge, he's going to wipe me out. So this was a thought process. If I shoot, I'm not going to do enough, and I'm going to be too far away, and he's going to get the objective. If I charge, maybe something can happen, and or or maybe something can can shift um, with that. So I charge him. Of course, my initiative is absolute garbage. So James is is um, hitting me first. Like he misses. He like missed everything. Or maybe he took out like one warrior. Maybe it was four warriors. But, but he, he did nothing, essentially. So right away, we're like, wow, this is weird. 
I wasn't going to count up my attack dice, but I guess I have to now. So I go, I hit everything. James has to make armor saves. He rolls three ones on it. So when something like that happens, um, it goes against your the, the bias. It goes against that, and you're like, well, it's not really about critical mass. No, no, it is, except for these moments, these crazy moments where the dice gods intervene. It is about critical mass. So the challenge with the assault is that um, shooty-based elements, 40K rewards shooty in that shooty units, shooting units, in that they can get the jump on you usually before you assault. And it could be through movement. It could be through delivery systems. Um, it, it could be through a variety of reasons on there. That makes achieving critical mass that much harder. Um, the second reason is that not only do they get the jump on you, you are going to have to cross the table. Okay, Someone that looks at your assault army, they're going to see, and this could be even small elements, small pockets of assault, they're going to look and see, Fritz has got to get across the table. So there's no incentive. Um, we talk about the gaming table. Think about your last game. Visualize what that looked like. Um, you've got your deployment zone. I've got my deployment zone. That's like an invisible band on your side and my side of the table. And we have the midfield, that kind of mid band on there. And it might expand or contrast depending on the deployment model we're using. You're not going to go into the midfield if you see a, an army that's going to run forward to get you into base-to-base -base assault. You're going to hang back and shoot, even if you're not a shooty army. I'm going to take losses going in. So when I finally hit you in the assault, do I have the dice, the physical dice pool? Do I have the critical mass to make that happen? So as a, I was going to say as a chaos player, but as an assault player, you need to be able to generate volume of dice and you need to have a delivery system in order to do that. So that right away, that those are the two checklists right there. Understanding the assault and understanding dice generation. How you do that, I can't answer. I can offer um, ideas with my corny berserker army, the berserkers of Scalathrax. I can offer examples of how I come up with that equation. Um, but it's really going to be up to what army you're playing, what units you want to draw from, um, what level of play, and, and what you enjoy on there. Let's talk about the wave theory. And I have to define the wave theory. Um, a lot of these definitions in 40K that I throw around uh, they're definitions that, that I came up with just because that's kind of like what I understand in the moment. And I remember when I first introduced this, it was misinterpreted literally like a wave. Like, here's wave one. So we send out wave one. And when that's done and destroyed, um, we send out wave two. And then when that's done and destroyed, we send out wave three. I mean, it, it makes sense, right? And when I heard this repeated back, I was like, yeah, I, I see the mistake in my definition. I'm defining wave as crashing, right? A wave crashes into you. It, the whole thing smashes into you. The, the, the momentum, the kinetic energy of that wave smashes into you and grinds you down. That's what we're looking to, to do. So with an assault-based army, you can't feed bits and pieces. You can't feed unit to unit. You don't have any skirmish units. You don't have any kind of commando units, um, those definitions, and podcasts are up in my archives. Because what's going to happen is if I take um, a really jacked up unit and I send it out, it's literally your entire army getting the jump on because you're shooting, you outrange me, um, getting the jump on me to shoot first. You have four, five, six, seven volume of dice sources versus my one volume of dice that's going to try and save. You're just going to blast me off the table. Now my army's that much weaker, so I'm, I'm literally bleeding dice. I'm, I'm literally sweating dice and bleeding dice on the table. So the wave theory is I hit you with everything at once. So we've got wave one, wave two, wave three, wave four. These are the groups, but they're all moving forward at once, and they can all be interdispersed. So when you look at it from that perspective, your opponent just literally sees all your models moving out. I'm going to share with you some of the models that I utilize. And again, the link will um, kind of fill it in more. You got to look at your own models. You got to look at your own, what you want to play and fill in one, two, three, and four. So the first wave goes right into your opponent's deployment zone. They're going to deploy as far forward as possible. They're going to run across the table for Cornate glory. They're going to crash into your opponent's deployment zone. They're going to take a beating. They're going to get shot up. They're going to be eating volume of dice. And we just talked about not sending something across. But remember, everything's moving at the same time. 
So everything's intermixed. If I can make it to, to, to the middle of the game and then these units get wiped out, they've done their job. So if you have nerd rage, if you have neckbeard rage, dice rage of losing models in 40K, you got to get out of the assault game because it's literally you're going to lose like 99% of your army and it's going to be two or three dudes standing. Um, we played one game. We played one game when, when Titans, the um, excuse me, Imperial Knights, a.k.a. Titans, were just released. So everybody's just rocking a Titan. Everybody's rocking an Imperial Knight. I mean, at least they're building it and they're spray painting it black, okay, or white to get on the table and counting it as colored. And I had um, colored and painted. I had my, I had a group of Cornate Berserkers taking an objective. And I had to be on that objective. They're fearless. I charged the knight. You know, the knight's like, oh, it's on the other side of the table, moves 36 inches, ignores everything, stomps everything, de-weapons on everything. You know, this was the previous edition where it was like, and this thing is 125 points, and my land raider is 250 points, something, and then I got to pay plus 25 points for possession. I mean, this is, this is crazy even by GW standards. I'm, I'm freaking out, and I'm nerd raging over it. Like, what? Anyway, um, my cornate um, warriors here, my corn berserkers, this knight's, you know, sitting on the hill, got the objective. I'm like, take that hill. Take that hill for corn. We charge. We do absolutely nothing. It stomps on us. We lose like three or four guys. Um, somebody else hits it with some other D weapon or something. It might have even been the Imperial player because there's multiple Imperial players on the side. And it scatters. It does whatever. Hits the Titan. Explodes the Titan. You know, uh, destroys everything. You know, D12 inches out plus six or whatever. Anyway, Two Cornate guys. One Cornate guy is standing on the top of the hill, literally on the Battle for Salvation objective. That is how you play a Cornate army. You have to have, or, or an assault army, excuse me, you have to have the fortitude. I was going to say the brass balls, right? But you, you got to be, I got to watch that, the YouTube algorithms. I'm getting pumped. I'm getting excited for the assault here. I'm getting jacked up, right? The butcher's nails are starting to fire up in my, my brain. I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready here. Right, I would be there on Terra, uh, you know, definitely, absolutely. But that's you're going to lose all of your stuff. It's going to happen. You have to accept it. So this this first wave going in is entirely expendable. The idea is to keep your opponent or opponents busy and having a great time blasting stuff up. You need a mix. So whatever um, portion of your army, based on size and what you're playing, you're going to devote to that. It needs to be a mix of two things. You need to have critical mass. So it's not just one unit. I mean, it could be in a very, very small game. It's going to be three, four, five, six units doing this, this wave one. I need, you need volume. So when you hit, you have critical mass of models and dice to actually not so much do some damage in the assault. You are, but to lock up and, and just churn bodies and keep your opponent busy. I've got big groups of cultists. Those are my numbers. Um, cultists have gotten toned down a little bit, in my opinion. But, you know, look, you throw up enough dice in 40K, um, you're going to lose models. Your opponent is going to roll poorly. If I can get you to roll enough dice, you know, anytime you've got to roll dice in 40K, bad things are going to happen. They're going to pop up. So if I can generate enough alpha, make you roll, doesn't matter what the unit is. You're going to roll poorly on there. So I've got cultists. They're my, my dice buckets. Then I've got um, a Cornate Lord jacked up on a Juggernaut. I do get sad when he gets blasted off the table early. Uh, it's nothing personal. I understand my opponent kind of has to do that, but it's still sad face. Um, he's going in with spawn packs, and that's going to generate there. I've got a Vindicator. Got to play Vindy. And I've got a Land Raider with Terminators. So nothing really crazy. Nothing really um, jacked up. They're units that I enjoy playing. If I have more points, I'll drop in Terminators 2 along with that. That whole wave one is going in. That whole wave one is just, just going to go in. I'm going to try and keep you busy. I don't want to learn lose stuff turn one, but hopefully I last um, turns out. If the Land Raider gets blown up, the dudes run forward. If something happens, we just, we just run forward, forward, forward. No retreat, nothing. All Cornate glory. Wave two. Now, remember, these are mixed in here, and everything's moving forward at once. But I make sure once we get into that ready-to-launch assault range, the Wave 1 hits first. Wave 2 
is the cleanup crew. Wave two is the group of people that, or models, or, or whatever it's going to be, that this is the true assault. This is, this is the mop-up crew where I have enough dice, I have enough volume of dice with these units that my opponent, in theory, has already been weakened enough. Their dice pool in terms of wounds, in terms of potential saves, you know, modified for toughness in my attack, is low enough that I'm going to Rick roll in there and just, just wipe them out, put them to the bolt pistol and chainsword. Uh, this is where my legions of corn berserkers are. This is where they're rhinoed up. Occasionally, I'll throw in some, some generic chaos space marines, you know, depending on the points or depending on what's, what's going on. If I need a little bit of support on there, we'll play around with that. But this is, this is wave two. You need a delivery system and you need a protection system to get them up there. Protection system could be good old boxes, rhinos, or protection system could be if you have enough alpha and enough stuff for the wave one to keep them busy. Tyranid players, you could do this, right? If you have your lots and lots of little bugs going in and just flooding the table, um, your, your big zillas and, and big bugs going in you know, could do something like that. Third wave is going to be the, um, the flank, the left or the right side of the table, because I want to keep my opponent's um, attention divided a little bit, and as they castle up, because that's how you deal with an assault-based army, that does expose potentially one of their flanks. There's also this tendency, um, since I don't know what armies I'm going to face, there's this idea that as I charge in, um, I'm going to have to point the bulk of my assault forces in one direction on the table. If my opponent has any heavy weapon teams, special weapon teams, um, teams that can deal out good alpha dice damage from a distance, they're not going to put them in the central core. They're going to put them on the left or the right. So if I have an outflanking unit, something that moves fast and hits in the assault, that's going to deal with those units. It's going to divide my opponent's attention. It's going to allow me to strike on the side. This wave, in terms of model resources, is a little bit smaller. Because remember, I've got to balance all this out on the points. The bulk of my points is in wave one. The second bulk of my points is in wave two. Minimal is wave three, and, and you'll adjust. Um, for this, it's Hellbrutes. Honestly, they're okay, but I've got, like, honestly, eight to ten of them ready to go. You know, at the time that the, uh, whatever, the Dark Millennial set that, that came out where it was Chaos versus Dark Angels. Uh, once that was released for a while, everyone's got hell brutes, and, and you could just pick them up for next to uh, nothing, and you could kind of repose them um, a little bit. And then space dogs, molar fiends, probably better models, probably raptors. If I was going, um, you know, for the non kind of theme, I, I really like the the molar fiends and like the space dog perspective on there. There's always better units. You'll, you'll kind of balance this out, but they just run right up the side and do what they have to do. Wave four, the smallest piece. And again, this is, you need the volume of dice, you need all the stuff. I didn't say it was easy. This is a unit or units that you're non-committal with. Um, the thing with a, a assault-based army, it's forward all the time. You can't stop, you can't slow down, you can't try to pause and take cover, um, you can't move forward and move around the side. It's like, where do I have to go? And I go. Maybe I make it. Maybe I don't. You know, it's like that scene from Braveheart. They're talking, and it's like the nobles, they're doing a deal. If they do it, we go home. If not, we charge. I mean, that's literally what it is. At the start of the game, we're just charging in. So I have a direct plan for everything. We'll see how things shake out, right, for corn. But this fourth group, this fourth wave, I have no plan for. And it's, it's the smallest amount. And this is just there for, for two reasons. One, as the, on the way in, if the dice gods do not favor my sacrifices to corn and things are going not so great or I start making some mistakes and I need a little bit more push in one of my waves, whether that's one, wave one, uh, wave two, or wave three, uh, this unit can kind of break off and reinforce. I use hell turkeys for this. Likewise, um, if my opponent, I won't say makes a mistake, but if they give me something that I can gobble up with the hell turkeys for free, you know, if you're going to just, just give me something, some scouts or, or some bikes or something on there, then I'm going to go because at some point I'm going to have to deal with those other elements. You give me free stuff, I'm, I'm going to try and grab it. 
I'm going to try and grab all your toys. So this, this fourth wave kind of is, is holding back. It's looking. It's waiting. It's seeing. That's the idea. That's the plan. And again, this wave analogy is not send out the first wave, wait for them to self-destruct. Send in the second wave, wait for them to self-destruct. Everything's mixed in. And I've got some battle report pictures in the links that, that are going to show this. And now that you kind of have the blueprint to my units, you're going to be able to literally see kind of like how they're moving and, and where they're moving and, and what they're doing on there. Why I really like playing this army. And this is just my opinion on it. Um, I love the narrative. I love Coronate Glory. I love the assault in all games. In Battletech, I'm running my mechs up to like try to punch you out. Um, Chain of Command, World War II. Um, I give those orders, and we throw lob a bunch of uh, hand grenades over, and then you know we, we, we charge. We just go in. We do that. Um, I'll charge tanks. I'll charge whatever. I, I don't know. I just like those aspects. I, I blame it on... I blame... Oh, I won't blame it. It, it started when I was playing historicals, DBA, DBN, or actually DBA with my Romans. And, and marching my Roman legions up, you know, it's like something right out of Gladiator. And I've got my siege machines. I originally started playing Romans because I loved the siege machines that you could get in DBA. And, and just slowly marching up my legionnaires and just charging in. And, and just it, that really captured my imagination. That was really a major influence um, for me. And with 40K, the reason why I like this army is it's very orc-like, right? If I win, I win. All the glory is mine because I beat your army. I beat your rule set, Games Workshop, that doesn't favor the assault. I advanced the narrative. I did all that. If I lose, well, it's corn, right? I had a great time playing. We had some some moments where there were there were glimpses of glory, of possible glory on there, on the narrative. It didn't quite work out, right? Okay, no big deal, right? Martial honor. Um, but from a tactical side, I really enjoy it because you play a lot of games of 40K. You win, you lose. I'm not saying that winning is not important. I want to win, but I, I've lost a lot of games. I've won a lot of games. Um, now at this point, like Maximus, I want to be entertained. I want something cool to happen. I want to have some fun, win or lose, or regardless of who I play. I want to have rivalries. I want to have um, talking about games in the future, you know, past glories and stuff. I, you become attached to your models. I pull out my models and literally they're like an avatar. I, I can hold them and, and see the glories that they've done. And in playing an assault army, as you march forward, as you're surging forward, forget about what that looks like on the narrative, on the Black Library narrative, there's this moment where your opponent is, is you know, back to that first narrative. That's, that's what it captures at the beginning of this podcast. You're looking, you're rolling dice, you're going crazy. And there's this moment, there is this moment where next turn I'm either going to make it and crash into your lines or I'm not. It's going to come down to this moment. I mean, talk about the ultimate chaotic neutral uh, moment here. It's going to come down to the dice. Can we pull this off? Can we do it? And, and from that perspective, it's addictive. I don't know if it's like adrenaline rush, but it's, it's gambling and another type of, of perspective. I don't know. But in that moment, it's like I'm entertained. We're going to do this. We're going to have a lot of fun. And uh, from the very least, I mean, there's certainly some very potent assault builds. There's certain some very potent units. Uh, the one thing about running an assault-themed army, an assault-based army, and I forgot one important point that I'll finish with in a footnote here. No one's going to accuse you of being beardy, of being a rules lawyer, of being cheesy. Like, it, it, it's impossible. It's impossible. No matter how the battle turns out, that's an impossibility. Uh, the final piece of this, investing, and I should have interjected this uh, somewhere in the middle. In terms of model resources and points and abilities... Um, we have different phases of the game. The psychic phase, uh, we have in the shooting phase, we have different phases of um, weapons that are geared towards uh, anti-tank, anti-monstrous creature, you know, being able to deliver a significant amount of wounds and, and bypassing higher toughness values or multi-wound values on there. Um, we have stuff for taking out infantry, you know, strength four or maybe a little higher, lots of multiple shots in there. Uh, there's different weapon profiles geared to taking out different aspects of the game. 
when you are pouring all of your points into the assault, because you're going to take losses on the way in, and then when you crash into your opponent's lines, you're going to need to generate alpha dice to be able to take them out, alpha meaning the highest uh, possible amount of dice that you can, focusing on, on, um, focusing on other aspects other than the assault is a zero-sum game because you're never going to be able to focus in enough points to have a legitimate answer to deal with those aspects. You need to pour all of your resources into the assault. That's why it's not for the faint of heart, because you might get rolled over on there. And um, in generating the massive amount of assault value going in, that literally keeps your opponent busy and focused, you know, as you're crashing up and down their line and, and kind of operating on that. So you can't, it's not an all takers list where I might not be the best in every area of the game, but I have enough to hold my own and the areas where my opponent is weaker than me, I'm going to look to push and capitalize on that. It, it just doesn't work with an, an all assault based army. You're dedicating everything, everything into the assault. This is only supposed to be like a 10 minute podcast um, response. But I think it gives us a couple of ideas, a starting point. And again, I'm going to put the link underneath this podcast. I'm going to show off all my units uh, for my Cornate Berserkers. can follow up with Tyranids if there's some interest in there. Um, because those are two armies that I run exclusively um, assault-based. And then I'm going to post up some battle report pictures and some narrative there. So uh, I'll organize the pictures in the order that they happen. And see if you can identify wave one, wave two, wave three, wave four, based on the units and the positioning, and and see how they're they're interlocking and they're working together, as opposed to again just save wave one out, wave two out, wave three out, because then you're just you're just feeding your opponent bits and pieces of your army, and it's going to go absolutely um, nowhere on there. And as always, questions, comments, feedback. Um, if you want to get a hold of me by email, you can use the contact form on my blog. I uh, probably shouldn't say this, but it goes directly to my phone. So whatever legitimate um, business I'm doing for, for school and for work and stuff, it's, it's a welcomed excuse to like not do that. Um, a lot of different ways because certainly I really enjoy the assault in all games that I play, but especially 40K for that narrative.